Welcome to another episode of Dead Head Space. I am your host, Patrick R. McDonough, joined by my friend, Brennan LaFar. Say hello, Brennan. Hello, everybody. And our other friend, Candace Nola. Say hello, Candace. Hello. And today we are joined by the author of Sleeping Beauties and the curator, amongst other books, Owen King. Say hello, Owen. Hey, how y'all doing? We're very excited to be talking to you. Brennan, take us away. So, Owen, we want to jump in. We want to ask you, did you always want to be a writer? Or I wonder if you had, if you've ever felt any pressure to kind of join the family business. Uh, yeah, I've, I've told this story quite a few times, but, you know, when I was a kid, I, um, I, I, for as long, long as I can remember, I loved books and, um, and I loved to write and, and I loved stories and it was something I enjoyed, you know, but my mom and dad both were full-time writers as I was a kid when I was a kid, I should say. And, um, it was for me a little bit daunting, uh, that they would go to their offices in the morning and I would hear them in those days, they used typewriters or like rudimentary word processors. Uh, and they would just be clattering on the keys for, you know, five, six hours at a time. And, um, you know, the door was shut and they were the only ones in their offices. And I think that what struck me as a kid was, uh, wow, that's a lot of work. And two, it's really lonely work, you know? And, um, I, I found that a little bit, um, frightening, honestly. And so I, I, I still wrote as a kid and, and I, I was always a avid reader, um, but it wasn't until I, I was in college or, you know, early in college that I started to feel like, well, maybe, you know, this feels like the thing I want to do. So maybe I can do what they do, you know, and it and it took a long time for me to. Um, for it to be second nature, where the way it is now, where I just like drop on the chair and I just work, you know, and it's like, it, I mean, it wasn't until my late twenties really that it was, you know, where there wasn't some part of me that was like, well, you got to do this. Um, and, uh, you know, so now for the last, you know, 15, 20 years or whatever, it's just been a job that I love to do. But up until that point, there was a lot of willful, effort that went into it, which I think is totally natural. Um, but of course the, you know, among the many, I've had many advantages in my life. I've been a very lucky person, um, very privileged person, but, uh, I think one of the ones though, that went along with, um, that is that to me, writing seemed like a viable job. Right. And I think that, you know, a lot of writers when they're growing up, that's a hump you've got to get over. Um, that, you know, how could you make a living doing this? And of course, you know, I was under the misbegotten impression as a child that it was a pretty normal job, <laughs> you know? And so that was something that, again, one of the, one of the many ways in which I've been very lucky in my life was that, um, although I found the prospect of doing the job pretty overwhelming, it did seem like a job. It didn't seem like a, um, fantasy to me it was a job that my parents did and so it seemed possible possible yeah yeah um i, I want to jump back to you know you kind of focused in on it's you know it's a vocation it's a job but it seems like it can absolutely be lonely i wonder if there was ever a time where you envisioned yourself you had a dream maybe a job that you wanted to work toward that was the opposite way that you know, would surround you with people all the time? And if so, how did, how did it end up impacting your writing? Well, I love to collaborate. And that's something, especially, you know, in between projects that I do on my own, I love to get together with somebody and work on something I wrote up. Um, let's see how, how, what was the, you know, after I did my first book, I edited a collection of short stories with my friend, John McNally. And after I did my second book, I wrote a graphic novel with my friend, Mark. Uh, and then I, and then we did the book with my dad and then, um, you know, I've collaborated on scripts and things in between. And I think that, um, you know, when I was a kid, I, I loved playing baseball 
love playing on a team. I thought that was super fun. Um, I love that camaraderie. And I don't know, maybe there's something of that in, I never really thought of it that way, but maybe there's something of that in collaborating on, on books um, and on screenplays and things like that. I mean, I'm sure that, uh, you know, it doesn't seem to me the concept is that what, what I like about doing that, I'm sure is something about the same thing that you guys like about doing the show together, which is that when I work with somebody, they have an idea and then I spring from their idea and I find it inspiring, you know, the same way that I'm sure if you guys are like, oh, I got this question I want to ask this writer and somebody else will be like, oh, and then we can, you know, get into this. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I mean, I really enjoy that. I think that that's, um, it takes a while for it to wear out, you know, like it's, it's a good, good time. And if you, um, and then when it does wear out and I'm like, I just got to be by myself and do something, then, then I can go and do that. Um, so. That's incredibly astute though. I don't think anyone's ever said that before about, uh, pretty much having a team thing. Cause I started this and it's a lot different when you have like, it's fun, but, uh, you have up and ups and downs in life, in the career, whatever you choose. And Brennan, Brennan is someone that I credit for being there for the last three, four years. And then Candace is newer with us over the last year. And it just feels like a family now. And who doesn't like a family that you get along with? Who doesn't like to just have a family gathering? Because there's almost nothing that can make you feel upset, sad, or ruin your day. And that's how I feel with Candace and Brennan. And I'm just piggybacking off of your point because it's being a podcaster, it's fun on your own, but I mean, I I don't know if I would have gone over 200 episodes without them. And now I never want to stop. Yeah. I think that I I've never really understood I mean, I guess I understand it in the abstract, but I know a lot of people that like to collaborate on things. And I think this would be the same thing with podcasting uh, where they 100%. like to be friction. Yeah. And I, I don't, I don't want that, you know, like it, I want something that's more along the lines of, you know, my collaborator and I are thinking along very similar lines with like a really similar um, concept but like twice the ideas. Um, so, and I, 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 th- I think that there's, there are like a lot of shows, talk shows and things where people like to have that, like they're half angry at each other all the time, but I, I can't, I couldn't do that. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, I, I don't, I don't. Yeah, no. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> no, thanks. So, so I, I, I'm just going to throw in, I really like the fact that you know, when you're talking about collaboration, that there's a lot of diversity in there because, you know, collaborating on editing an anthology versus a graphic novel versus a novel, those are all going to be very different experiences shared with different people. Um, And I definitely want to come back to that at some point, but I also don't want to hog the floor the whole time. So I'm going to ask one more question and I'm going to throw it to Candace. What was your position when you played baseball? Uh I played um, first base and I played uh, a little bit of right field and I pitched and I grew really early. So I was like the height I am now as a 12 year old, I was six foot two. And so I I was a pretty imposing presence in little league. (laughs) But then I stopped growing, you know, and um, uh, I just never, um, that was definitely the peak of my abilities. You know, I just, I mean, I still played in high school, but I fell farther and farther behind because I just wasn't physically getting any stronger. I was just a lanky person who, you know, couldn't throw any harder when I was 18 than when I was 12. But, um, but I loved to play and I, now I just love to watch. Yeah. I, it's, a, it's a perfect answer though, too, because right, you know, outfield, infield pitcher, there's your, you know, there's your novel, graphic novel and, and anthology, a little bit of everything. Sorry, Patrick, I interrupted you. It's about baseball and I don't talk about yeah. baseball often, but I don't think I'm romanticizing this, but I, I don't follow like I'll, I'll watch the Red Sox because like that's Boston's my whole team for everything. But um, I don't go on my way to watch baseball anymore. But when I grew up, I loved it. 
And thinking back, like the 90s, uh, say what you will about steroids, but they made as a fan fun. You got Sosa and Maguire just crushing the shit out of balls. Yeah. <laughs> you got you got so many. It, it was it was basically like how many home runs this year are we gonna see from from right. these guys? Uh I'm just wondering if if you have uh like a decade of baseball that you can say like that was unbelievable because for me it's the 90s the whole run itself was just nuts oh well i mean i think for me it would be the aughts you know because then the red Sox uh, the world series yeah, and, okay yeah 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 because they, they won in 04 and then they won yeah. in 07 and um that was like <laughs> you know the end of a nightmare that i'd been living <laughs> for as long as i was you know yeah. aware of anything you know it was just really nice to win the world series and not have to you know bear that oh for sure uh candace take it away hi so since we are at the uh the earlier stages of life i guess here i'm gonna start with did you have an experience a moment in the early stages of your writing life that impacted you more than any other one? And if so, what was it and why? That's a great question. I um, And this is a story I've told a lot, but I, I think it has some value for people. Um, I think a lot of people who watch the show probably are interested in writing and writing themselves. And um, after I've published my first book, I <clears throat> I remembered feeling like, you know, I'd really accomplished something. And um, there's a couple aspects to this. And I, I remembered getting the, um, the box with the galleys in it. And I was so excited to get it. And I was really proud of the book. And... Um, I felt like, you know, I, it was like the solution to me, you know? And, uh, I mean, you know where this is going, which is like, I opened the box and I, I had like five seconds of like, did it, you know, <laughs> this is awesome. And then I was like, oh shit, I'm st you know, I didn't like transform, you know, and ascend. And it was like a crushing, um, half realization that like, uh, oh, you know, I'm happy I got this book, but I, I'm actually still me. And, um, and then I, I think that it, it, it was kind of hanging over me for a while. It took me a while to get into the, to the next book, I think, because I was like, you know, I got to do this all over again and I got to make it better. And, um, Plus, I also have to like um, get all the things about me in order that I actually have to get in order that the book didn't fix, and um, and so that that was one thing. And then on a sort of related note, I would say that sometime after I published my my first book, I I wrote a story uh, I still really like. I, I it's called The Cure, and it ended up being published in a in a magazine called One Story, and I was super proud of the story. And it got rejected by a couple magazines. And I I had been, I had submitted, you know, many things over the years and been rejected, but it was all sort of prior to the first book. And I um I was like a, I was a little freaked out because I was like, I, I think I really got this done. I think this is really good, and I'm really excited for people to read this story, but but I'm getting these rejections and I I called up my friend, John McNally, and this was around the time we were working on the superhero anthology. And I said to John, I'm really embarrassed to ask you this because John is kind of a mentor to me. And I love John's books and I have so much respect for him. And I said, do you ever still get rejected? And he just starts laughing. And, um, and John was like, you know, the, all the time, you know, there's some waiting for me in the mailbox right now, you know? And, um, and it just, it had not really sunk into me. And it, this was way back in the 
you know, 2008 or nine or something. Um, it had not sunk into me that, you know, even somebody like John Updike still gets rejected by the New Yorker. You know, that's what I was thinking about at the time. Uh, of course he's gone now, but, uh, that John Updike and, um, you know, would have been a little later on, but Zadie Smith and, uh, you know, the very best, um, Alice Monroe, even, you know, the very best writers you can think of still get it handed to them, yeah. you know, sometimes. And that that is, um, nothing changes that and it's forever. Um, and that, you know, rejection still hurts, but kind of like talking that out with my friend, John, that time that really, and I think I, I kind of knew it, but it, it hadn't, I just wanted to make sure um that it was still like a constant thing for other people and um that was that was a a really helpful moment and i have found ever since the process of submitting stories and novels and screenplays and all the different things you know easier because you i realize i'm going to hear no more than anything yeah did you take it personal for a while? Because uh, I'm sure I'm sure most people do, but it it took me speaking from personal experience. It took me about six six or so years until I not that I lashed out at anyone. Just to be very clear, but uh, it felt kind of like oh man, it, I put my heart and soul into this. And I yeah. asked this. I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, but I specifically asked for the new writer that might be listening or a newer writer. Um, I would just like to pick your brain um, on, on that aspect of of kind of how you evolved when you started with getting a rejection to where you're at now. And then, Candace, sorry I interrupted, so please pick up after that. Uh, yeah, I I mean, I still, I think if, um, I think when I was, when I was younger, I sometimes felt I like the rejections I was always excited when I got a written rejection and that was very, that made it a lot easier because I'd be like, wow, this person really took the time. And, um, and I know they don't have much time because they get a lot of stuff, you know? So the, I always felt like that was a really meaningful thing. <clears throat> I mean, it's impossible to never get something and a review would be the same as the same zone. You know, it's impossible to never still take it a little bit personally sometimes. But, you know, you, but one of the things I remind myself of all the time is that, you know, once you um, publish something, certainly, um, it doesn't really belong to you anymore, you know? And, um, uh, And there's no sense in hanging on to it. You know, you can't control it once it's gone. It's just, it's out there and it belongs to everybody then. Right. Does that ant answer it, Pat? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to okay. interrupt again. <laughs> okay, so... That all actually makes a whole lot of sense because I know there are plenty of us out here that are still like, oh, well, imposter syndrome and I got a rejection again and I have 200 and some rejections and I got another one and it doesn't get any easier. I think each one hurts in a way because you wrote it it became a personal thing. You put it out there because you wanted it to go towards whatever that submission was. But I think you need to also learn as you go along that not every story is going to fit every open call or every project or anthology that is out out there, usually the person in charge has something in mind that they want. And no matter how great you are or what your name is, I think we're all going to have those 
times where something we write just doesn't quite fit what they want. It's not a personal thing. I think 99% of the time, I'm sure you have this few times where someone's like, oh, I don't want her. (laughs) Yeah. But I'm sure that most of it is just, the story is just not what they want for whatever it is. And I think we all just need to be like, okay, well, great. And now I can send it to another home. You know, it's not actually a no, it's a, hey, here's another doorway, you know, put it through this one. And there's hundreds of places to submit to. I think that's a great attitude. And and I I also think that it's as much as you can, if you can not kind of like, um, park yourself while you wait to hear back about things. It's like, if you can, not everybody can, but if you can mm-hmm. send the thing out and then just get to work on the next thing and try to forget. Right. Right. Um, just keep it moving. Yeah. Yeah. So with that being said about the processes and rejections and the whole experience being an author, how about your books, sir? How about your books? <laughs> so I want to get into um, the curator first. And it's very involved. There's a whole lot of moving parts in that story. (laughs) I want to start with how did that outlining process look? How involved was that to keep all of that straight and sort of just moving along? (laughs) Yeah, I had a, well, I wrote a short story um, several years ago that was called The Curator. And it was the, it was just the general um it was like all things that happened um when d is in the museum and so she still gains the curatorship of this strange museum and there's still the burned down building beside it and there's the embassy on the other side and so i wrote this story and it um uh and i knew that there were all these things there were all these things implied about what's happening outside uh, but I kept it really tight setting wise and it's still like a 40 page short story. Um, but I was, um, and I, and I was pretty happy with the way it came out and I was, um, it made an impression on me how much people seem to like it. Mm-hmm. And that felt like an invitation to kind of explore this story that was much bigger, that was in the back of my mind that had the same characters, although they changed a lot in the book from what they had been in the short story. So when I was writing the book, you know, I, I had that story. I ha- actually have like the copy of it that was in um, Lady Churchill's Rosebud Wristlet, which is the name of the journal. I, I had that copy of it that I kept open. It's all wrinkled and underlined and, um, you know, there's probably like three sentences from the story that survived into the book. But, you know, I used that to think about kind of like time inside the book because the story still has the same essential events happening at the the same basic times. Um, It's just a lot of that is like happening in the white space of the story, Mm -hmm. you know, in between sections. So that actually made it really easy um, in a general sense. And then I did a little outlining because I I had these other characters that I wanted to introduce and I wanted to track their stories and see how it intertwined because, um, I mean, one of the the challenges of the story is that... um, And just just to, for the people that haven't read the book... um, the the premise of the story is that this uh we're in this unnamed country in the late 19th century and there's been a revolution and a young woman uh named dora she thinks of herself as d um she uh sort of uh contrives to gain the curatorship of this strange little museum on an obscure little street in this city and uh she has a number of um 
concerns that aren't entirely clear at the beginning of the book that become clearer as it goes along. There's the things that she's interested in finding out. Mm -hmm. And um, the way the book operates is like, um, I mean, the first hint is that she thinks of herself with a different name than the name that other people call her, right? So that's the first hint that she's not who we think, she is not who she seems to be. And Mm -hmm. so the book operates like a mystery box, right? Like she isn't who she seems to be. The museum isn't what it seems to be. The street isn't what it seems to be. The embassy next door, the man there is definitely not who he seems to be, right? (laughs) And so these different things open up. Um, But one of the challenges of the the premise, and I mean, one of the things I like about Dora, about Dee, and why I think she appeals to me, and I like her so much as a heroine, is that she has all these challenges that come with being a woman in a 19th century setting, right? It's a ultra patriarchal society. There's a bunch of things, a single woman in her position, she's not going to be wandering around all the time. Right. You know, she, she is concerned with her safety and canny about maintaining it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so one of the problems that presented with telling the broader story is that it doesn't make that much sense for her to go places. You know, in the third section of the book, she leaves the museum and and hopefully people find it very exciting because she's taking a big risk, right? Um, But so one of the things that I had to, just to get back to what you were asking about outlining the book is that I had to organize the other characters in such a way that they... Uh, were showing us things that I wanted to see and that were important to Dora's story that she doesn't see, you know? And so yeah. it goes back and forth between them and her. Right. And to me, that kind of braiding made a lot of sense. And it actually wasn't, it wasn't that hard for me to keep it in mind, you know? Um and it is a, a heavy pull for the reader, but one that I hope that pays off because I never forget about anybody, you know? And and I guess also the other thing is the book is like, not like, it is very consciously meant to play the way that, uh, or in a way that is like a Victorian novel. You know, I'm not, yeah. that's what I'm writing from to a certain extent, you know, right. if you, um, you know, you read Great Expectations, Pip meets Magwitch, who has escaped from the the ship, right? You know, so uh, most of us, you, you know, the story. So the guy, uh, Pip is this young boy and he goes out into the graveyard. He's checking on his parents and he, in the graveyard, they're dead. And he lives with his um like his uh, cousin or something like that. And Magwitch, who is this escaped convict from a prison ship, you know, grabs him and is like, you know, you're going to help me. And Magwitch gets away, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't see him again for a long time, but he's super important, right? Right. And and there's this big cast of characters, you know, Joe and I uh, forget the name of his cousin that takes care of him. That's sort of in love with him. Uh, there's the two people that Pip lives with. And then there's Estella and um, Mrs. M- Mrs. Havisham. And, uh, and then the, the guy that comes and acts as his, like the, the agent for his benefactor. And, you know, you're, you're piling up all these characters, Right. right? but they're all winding in and out of the story mm-hmm. of Pip. And right. um, I find that kind of uh, panorama um, really appealing. I mean, it's, it's very similar to like long form television. Right. Um, and that's just like, that's my favorite kind of story. Um, and so you know, the idea is to take all the fantastical stuff and all the really gritty, like hopefully realistic 19th century stuff. It's meant to be super grounded, you know, it's not meant to be gilded and kind of mix that um, with that form 
to make a thing that's a little bit different that I hope people like. Mm. Hopefully that didn't sound too too pretentious, but that's what I was trying to do. No. Better or worse. <laughs> no, it worked well. <laughs> and the idea of that panoramic panoramic form um, that's just so expansive, you know, one thing that really caught my attention was you know, you always hear people talk about how a setting is the character. And in this case, I think it's it's the setting, it's the country, it's the history, it's the makeup of the society. And it's very, you read it and there's never a moment where the reader doubts that you have a complete and full understanding of every aspect of the makeup, but you're also having fun with it. There's al- al- there's almost a playfulness to it that, you know, at times reminded me of uh, Joseph Heller's writing. And I, I just, I wonder how, you know, kind of piggybacking off Candace's question with the outlining form, how in depth did you plan the history of this, you know, fictional place? Do you have notebooks on top of notebooks? Is it all in here? <laughs> um... I think I I improvised a lot of it, um, but certain things just suggested other things. Like the, I think that the, um, there's these standing stones on a cliff, and um, I in they I don't think they were in the short story, but the cliff was in the short story, and the cliff is like this place where like this um well i don't want to give too much away but it's a setting in the book and um and it was a setting in the story and it's a surprising place for a couple different reasons we don't expect to go there but um i think i put the stones in because there's a um in one of the museum cases there's a drill bit and the drill Mm -hmm. bit is for um you know uh drilling meteorites you know, there's like all these weird things in the museum. So there's like a whole section of drills that drillers use in this National Museum of the Worker where, where D uh, takes over as the curator. And so I think that I I thought about that drill bit and and that made me think, oh, what if there were, you know, ancient standing stones like at, um, what is it in England where the Druids were? Stonehenge? Like Stonehenge, you know, what if there were like these stones like that from, from that some ancient peoples had left there? And um, and then I, I thought to myself, well, if there were those stones there, the people, you know, the, the more modern people who live who would come later, they would have traditions about it. They would have ideas about what it meant. Right. Yeah. And then so that made me think at the very beginning of the story, there's a little myth about the founding of the city. And then that made me think about a little bit at the very, very end of the book. And so I, you know, just the drill bit made me, you know, write all these little pieces of it. And I just, things play off other things, you know, they all suggest. Absolutely. I think that's, I, I, I don't know if that's a satisfying answer, but I think that that's almost yeah. all the historical elements of it. I mean, some of the things came from, I, I read a bunch of books about um, Victorian London and um, Five Points in New York. And um, I read a book about Vienna at the end of the 19th century. And I, I stole, stole the wrong word. I um, riffed on some things that I read in those books from the real history. And I, I use some of those things for sure to build yeah. up, to build up the, sense of the place and to also make it feel like it's a little bit like the end of the 19th century, but it's also like a little bit like the middle of the 19th century and even earlier in some ways. So it's like a little bit of a mixed up timeline. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is a, to, to respond, it is a surprising yet satisfying answer. Cause I'm impressed as hell that there was that much improvisation there. Um, is that typically the way you approach a story? Is it, is it, are, are you typically more of a pantser than a plotter? No, I mean, I, I think it's a 50, 50, probably mm. like, I got to know where I think it's going to end. And um, I've got to know some, 
stuff along the way that's important, like the, the key turning points. I've got to have a sense of what those are. They could, I, it could all change, but I have to believe that I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and then, sure. you know, I do a lot of improvising and, um, and just, I mean, using the things that, that you, that I have made up to make up more things, you know, to spinning off. Mm. find that most of my probably most of my best ideas happen in that way or what I think are my best ideas scaffolding <laughs> I wanted to um, yeah. ask a question about the curator the short story you said that it was dedicated to Peter Straub who yeah um, we he's he's one of my biggest hero literature literary heroes as well um I got Coco up there for a reason yeah, yeah. because I know it's my much, favorite. Yeah, I know yeah. how much you love him, and and I I love him a great deal too. And Coco is like my one of my favorite books ever. But I bring him up because um, you said that you dedicated the short story to him. Now there's a few questions I have about him, but I know um, we talked to him in the summer of 2021, and. I believe it was at, I believe he mentioned at some point, he talked about you and your family and when you guys were in England and when he um, mm -hmm. first heard the talisman with his dad. I, I'm either mixing this up with one of the million interviews I've heard with your father, him and or you, but he, Peter mentioned that you and Emma have a strong connection. And I'm really curious from your point of view, um, it, how do I word this? So, <laughs> your both your fathers are pillars of literature. Without them, uh, it would be it would honestly be a different. We don't know what it would be like. Um, that's how big those two individually are. Now, when you got the next generation, both you and Emma are are you know excellent writers. You're well known for what you do. You made your own in in this world. So I'm wondering, what's the connection in your eyes with you and her specifically? I guess I I don't know. Are you guys friends? Do you guys? Yeah, I mean she's a that? she's a friend, and I and I like her books very much. And she's, um, I mean, not only is she a very good writer, she's made like an amazing contribution to the world of independent bookstores. Sure, yeah, you know, for sure. Books are, so, books are magic. Um, Brooklyn, and, New York. I, and I think <laughs> that um, you know, certainly she can relate to some of the aspects of of um you know having a a, a well-known writer as a father for sure there's a connection there mm -hmm. okay um yeah i i was just curious because that's that's such a unique position and i'm i'm sure like you just said very few yeah i mean i think that, that and, and you know um i guess emma's a little bit younger than me but we sort of grew up together but also we don't we're not from like the same place yeah so it's not like they were neighbors but um you know, I love the whole Straub family and I love Peter very much. And, uh, you know, I, I think I dedicated that story originally to Peter because I felt like, oh, he'll really get a kick out of this. Sure. Um, and he was very nice about it. And, uh, um, yeah, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad I, I was able to do that. Uh, one more question about Peter, and then we're going to go to a question that my brother's a teacher and, and sure. he actually had a student that I wanted to ask you something. Um, so I imagine Peter is basically like an uncle to you. It seems like you guys are that close. Um, yeah, I mean, it's fair? funny. Like I said, they're from New York. Yeah, yeah. Which is where I live now. I mean, yeah. um, I don't live in New York City, but um, I don't think I saw, I probably didn't see Peter for like a decade in there when I was in my teen years uh but he and Susie were so welcoming when I was living in the city and going to graduate school and uh yeah I mean and, and I and I love his books and I think I got more and more out of them as time went by you know because they're complex yeah yeah and I think that it took um I mean I always liked them but I think there's like second and third level stuff in there that I didn't always understand when I was reading them as a younger they're dense <laughs> and they're, they're very dense which i love yeah but i wanted to know if there was uh, 
good luck with this answer, but I wanted to know if there was one lesson of all the lessons you learned from him um, that you can really uh, apply to your own writing or life that you would like to share with other writers. I'm sure there's a million things you can pick, but is there one thing that sticks out? Well, I think that he took a lot of care with his language. Oh yeah. And um I think that's you know, I mean he's such an adept stylist. Um but that's not um should I say he makes what's really hard look really easy because he's so um fluid in that language and i think that that's something that i find inspiring and also um reminds me to take a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth look because i know how adept he was and I know his first drafts were probably really good, but I don't, there was a, I think Peter put a lot of sweat. I'm sure Emma would be able to confirm this. Um, <laughs> I, I think he put a lot of sweat into the language and into um, making sure that all the words were in the right places. And, uh, and I think just in general, you know, no matter what you're writing, care is important you want it to be really good and i think that um i mean it's a lesson i take from all the writers that i love but i i think of peter especially is one of the writers i think of in particular because his prose line is so fantastically cool Mm. and i mean he could really make it you know he could really dance he was like that when we talked to him too whether it be email or or on the episode we talked to him. his emails were very funny he was a very <laughs> um it was like a smart know, professor with humor yeah he i mean he wasn't like um i guess i would get a i got a few longer emails from peter i don't think of him as one of those sometimes i still you still run into somebody who's a really fabulous writer that writes like letters in their emails um which is wonderful uh, but Peter wrote some very, very funny notes and uh, it, I could tell he was doing it offhand, but uh, <laughs> so this is the language is always killer. That's great. Uh, so the question from my brother's student, they're high schoolers. Uh, Elizabeth wants to know, what was it like teaming up with your father on Sleeping Beauties? Um, this is kind of a three part, so I'll be happy to repeat any of okay. them. Uh, inspiration for Sleeping Beauties, what were they? And the last one that ties them all together, are there any parallels to Shawshank Redemption? Um, well, I, I'll take the first one. I think that it was so fun. I, I, this is one of those answers I've given before. Um, but I think there's something in it for everybody, which is that, or I hope maybe there is. Um, you might want to trim this little part. Um, <laughs> I did a little word salad in there. Um, what was really amazing was that, you know, I'm close with my folks, but we don't live in the same place. Um I mean, incredibly enough, I've lived in New York over half my life now. You know, I still consider myself a New Englander, but I don't know why. Um, (laughs) Honorary. Yeah. um, But so uh, I think that my parents and I are close, um, but we don't live in the same place. And it was uniquely special to me to be able to spend all this time that we took writing the book with my dad as an adult, you mm-hmm. know, it's like a, can't remember how old I was when we wrote it. Maybe it was like 40, 41 or something. Mm-hmm. 
And to spend all that time talking about stories and plotting this thing and, you know, going back and forth about it. And it was just really, it was really cool to have that time with my dad. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think a lot of people would say the same thing about, about spending a time with a parent when you're an adult. Um, I mean, in a fruitful way, it was, it it was great. Um, So that was the thing that I loved them. I mean, I'm proud of the book, um, but I think that was the thing that I think about the most is just like all the time we spent on the phone, you know, Um, talking, you know, all the emails back and forth and, um, you know, we would do this thing where we would go back and forth with the chapters, but we we would always leave a space in the somewhere in the chapter, and the one person would say, "Here's what I want to have happen here." Now you write this because we didn't want anybody to know who wrote what. <laughs> and um, you know, I just loved I loved doing that. So <clears throat> the whole thing was really fun. Um, oh, oh, and actually, before the next part, I actually want to jump in on you being in New York. I'm in yeah. New Jersey. I'm in South Jersey. My parents, they grew up in, and lived in Massachusetts their whole life. They're now in Florida. So I can relate to that where it, I, fuck it. I'm a New Englander for life, but I'm in South Jersey. But it is weird, kind of. Like, you grew up one way, and now life is all different, and your family's spread around. So yeah. I, just wanted to, I just wanted to throw that in there. I understand. It's, it's You just got to adapt, because there's no other way to go about it. Yeah, and you just don't. It, it was so rare and so um, just that everything fell just right so that we could do it. And the time, you know, the timing made sense. Um, we both had the time to do it and, you know, we're able to talk every day like that was, it was great. Um, did, did it make you feel closer? Um, if possible. <laughs> no, it's not exactly that. It's more just, um, I think it, it it is just having a daily relationship with somebody that you haven't had. You'd never have that relationship again after you're a kid, usually, you know, unless you, unless you like have a business together, right. That's you know, unless you're, you know, you have a law firm or, you know, a store or something that you run together, I guess that would be the different, but for me, you know, um, being close with my parents and talking to them every week is not the same as like working with my dad every day. So, uh, so that was, that was the thing that I uh, will remember the most about it and treasure the most. Um, In terms of um, where the idea came from, I think it it was just a one sentence premise. Like a lot of things that I write where I said to him, um, Actually, I, think, I remember what I said to him was, I never do this because he always has people coming up to him and being like, I got an idea. You know, <laughs> I got your next book for you. You know, it's a, it's about a guy and his tire blows out. And does your dad you know, really need it? He's lost on the idea. road, you know, and he, I mean, he gets, uh, you know, a thousand times a day, not a thousand times a day, but uh, I'm sure not a week goes by without somebody <laughs> saying that to him. Um, and it's never anything you know, drives him crazy. So um, I I said to him, you know, I've never done this before, but I just had this idea and you really should write it. It sounds like something you'd write. And it would be, what if one day uh, all the women in the world stayed asleep? And, you know, I mean, obviously it would be horrible and a nightmare would ensue. And I was like, it seems exactly like the kind of nightmare you'd like to write. And, um, and he said, wow, that's an awesome idea. I refuse. You have to do it. And I was like, I'm never going to do that. <clears throat> I'm working on something else. Um, but we kept talking about it. And I could tell that he was, um, I, I knew he'd like it. It was right up his alley. So, um, yeah, the more we talked about it, I was like, you know what? I'll write it, but you got to do it with me. Uh, <laughs> maybe he said that. I can't remember. Um, but that's what recall. He said you're the boss of some of his kids in another interview. And whatever you said he would do. <laughs> huh? What, what? Another interview I was watching with you and your father. 
he said you're the bossiest of his kids like in a way oh, yeah. and whatever whatever you said he would do which is exactly how i am with my kid could be could be um and then the last question was the shawshank redemption question and it's interesting um we did not the book doesn't seem to be happening in a stephen king universe i would say um we i i th remembered you know contemplating like a reference to the the place in the talisman where the where the guy is the has his crazy church or whatever it is i can't remember exactly I, there was some way where i was like oh you know we could refer to that in this place and then i i think i had second thoughts about it and it felt like such a standalone piece um so I don't, I, I, so the answer to that is, I don't think there's a whole lot of Shawshank Redemption in the, in the book. Um, but then again, it's also, you know, certainly all the parts in the prison, it's been a while since I read it or thought about it. Um, it's a big book well, too. Right. Um, uh, you know, obviously the experience of being incarcerated, um, the the characters in Shawshank, I'm sure there's some commonalities there, hmm. but I haven't read. I mean, I haven't read that book <laughs> in years, um, so I don't know. I can't say anything specific. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Uh, I appreciate you answering that. She's probably going to be pretty damn excited. So, all right, Thank you for making a high schooler reader reader happy, <laughs> uh, Candace. Um, before we get into my next one, didn't we have a Twitter question? We did. Started? I have that up if, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so Sarah Bartz says, I love the curator so much. Wondering who all you could see playing Dora in an adaptation. Who you all could see playing Dora in an adaptation. Oh no, mm -hmm. she wants our opinion. Let's start with Owen. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> um, uh, I guess that I was thinking of, um, uh, you know, the book is loosely, I mean, it's de it's pretty consciously referring to Little Dorrit, the Charles Dickens novel, which is also about a domestic who um, becomes involved in a conspiracy. Um, so, uh, you know, the person that comes to mind is Claire Foy in the miniseries of Little Dorrit, which is you know, 2006 or something like that. So she wouldn't be there anymore. It's like <laughs> her then. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. There's nobody, I mean, she should be, um, you know, between the age of 26 and 35, probably. And Robert should be between 20 and 22. You know, he's younger. He's a college kid. Um, you have to make sure but I guess whatever it is, you have to make certain that she's like five years older than him, whatever the actors are, or that he's five years younger than her, something like that. You want to be able to, you want to, do, you would want the actors to, you would want to have her feel more adult than him. Mm. Maybe that's the thing that's important. You know, she has lived a little bit longer. Um, mm. So... No, I haven't got any good ideas. What do you guys think? I, I want to go first because I, mine I'm excited about. Um, <laughs> her name's Anya Taylor Joy. She was a star mm -hmm. in Queen's Gambit. I she's, she's also, awesome. Yeah, she would she, be great. She can look the part. She's just a phenomenal actress. I think she would bring everything to the table for that. How about you, Candace? I'm horrible with this. I uh don't know many actors of names or anything, but um, I'm gonna agree with Pat Patrick. So she is one of the few that I know of, and as soon as he met, met, mentioned her, yeah, the fact that she is so striking—that's like cinematic, mm -hmm. you know. And she's it's such a good great. actor, you know. It doesn't yeah. matter that um, it's hard to imagine overlooking her. It's like she would make herself overlookable because yeah. she's so good. Right. I'm bringing up the Queen's Gambit again, but like she kind of is like D in that in that story. And then because think about it, she's playing chess 
and it's only men, at least I think it was. If it was, if there was another woman, I don't remember. And that's a game of wits, and she crushes all yeah. of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brandon, you know, I was gonna awesome. pitch, I was gonna pitch Karen Gillen, but honestly, Patrick, I think you got it. <laughs> That's the first time yeah. in my life everyone would say yeah. that to me. Sweet. I'm yeah, gonna see you guys right. later. I, I'm excited. <laughs> okay, I'm excited right. Bye. She's so she's yep. so good. She was in um who was she in that I liked her in so much? Um I, I like her. She was great in that M Night movie. Uh, menu. Mm. Uh the split one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Fabulous um movie. Glass. No, oh, split. I think she was in both of yeah. them, actually. Yeah, yeah. both. Uh, was she she's in both so, of them? She's so mm-hmm. electric. Yep. Um, I like her a lot. Okay. Well, we have it. That's great. We can let this do <laughs> There we go. Up. We can cast <laughs> the movie. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. So I have one last one and then we can go to whatever you guys have last and then wrap. I got one more question about the curator. Sure. Okay. Whatever it's my turn. Do you want to ask first? Yeah. Because I, oh, and I <laughs> talked about this. Yeah. That's um, fine. And I did not want to miss it. So I listened to the audio version and, um, I know that you, Owen, oh, that you are really, really happy with uh, Marin Ireland and her work. So I just want, I'm going to leave it there and, and say, tell us what your thoughts are on the audio yeah. version. I mean, she's amazing. She's, I think she's the best audio narrator working. And she's also a fabulous actor. Um, if you ever see her uh, on TV or in film, she's incredible too. Um, what I like about her love about her performances she can she has such a range of dialogue voices and in fact she's so good that sometimes her line readings get me rethinking the character um you know there's a there's a uh, a bar fly in the book and his name is marl and he and he has like a slur in all his dialogue and when i wrote him i was like he's gregarious you know but the wa- the way that Mirren reads him he's like uh, sodden sounding and uh, it's better, you know? And I, and I, and I, and I love the way that, that she and, you know, and, and any other artist that's narrating a book because it is an art form, the way that they bring their creativity to bear mm-hmm. on the thing that I wrote and make it theirs, you know? I think that is amazing. And, um, you know, I, I also, I find it incredibly difficult to listen to my own writing. But in this case, I, I mean, I was like, I like listened to it for like two hours, like skipping around one day. I was like, this is great. I was like forgetting, <laughs> you know, uh, I, and I was like, when I'm listening to my own stuff, I'm like hypercritical, but when I was listening to her read it. I was like, she's making me look really good. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> so. So she's terrific, and um, I was thrilled that she that she did it. Nice. Okay, so my last one was just really about advice. So as an author, what did you find was the most helpful advice that you were ever told? And likewise, what advice would you give to anyone new other than how to deal with rejections since we went over that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the best advice was the advice I got from John, which Mm. is just like, get used to it. You know, this is going to be, you're going to have to accept the fact that this is part of it. The rejection is, you know, continuous. Um. In terms of the advice that I that I would give to um, to other people, this is really not um, a unique piece of advice, but it's I think it's worth repeating because I I've talked to enough young people or uh, people that want to write books who say that they don't read that much or don't have time to read. You you have to read all yeah. the time. Um, <laughs> So that's that would be my number one piece of advice. And also, you may not need this, but I find it helpful to read as widely as I can. I want to hear yeah. um, 
different voices from different places and different times and different genres. I want to mix it up and um, I want to get all those things in my head and yeah. do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think when you read wider, it helps you increase your own range. You can't just read and write one thing all the time. It gets stale. So the more you read, especially the wider you read, it just helps you. So, Well, just, just yeah, to give like you an that. example, I mean, I think that, you know, if you're right, if you were writing like um, an epic sword and sorcery fantasy mm -hmm. and you read a book by Elmore Leonard, you could find something in there, you know, I mean, Elmore wouldn't be, would never write a book with dragons, right? Um, <laughs> he'd be like, what is this? You know, uh, maybe he'd think it was cool. I don't know. Um, but that's not what he was, he, that was not his thing, but there were things, all kinds of wonderful things that he did uh, with his language and with his, his whole angle of, uh, you know, his whole approach that you could take into any kind of a book or any kind of a story and, you know, gain something just thinking about the way that he, um, the way that his characters speak mm -hmm. and the way that he collapses um, time from, from one section to another, you saw all kinds of things. And that would be true of all sorts of terrific writers. You could right. carry something in and vice versa. Right. Makes sense for a for a fantasy novel if you were writing a crime novel or something like that. Right. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well. Brennan, All right. Next. I'm a, I'm gonna throw out one more so that we don't eat <laughs> okay. up your entire evening. Um, I am curious with your brother Joe opting to write under a pen name. What considerations did you make to publishing under your own name and? Throughout your career, how has reader response been to that with you not publishing exclusively in the horror genre? Um, I mean, it's a it's a long. I could say a whole bunch of different things about it, but I think that the biggest thing was. That when I first started publishing, I didn't think that um, I thought what I was doing was really different from Stephen King. Um, and so I didn't really th think anybody cared or would care. And, um, you know, I was wrong about that. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, I think that, um, you know, Stephen King fans have been super generous about, you know, a lot of them been interested and, and, you know, been enthusiastic about the things that I, that I write. And I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I think that was just, you know, um, naivete, um, basically. Yeah. I mean, I think that in, uh, I don't regret it though. Mm. You know, it's, um, I mean, it, it's, it's a choice I made and, and that was then, and, you know, go, uh, I've just sort of, you know, kept on the, the path and kept doing the things that I like to do and um, that are, that are interesting to me. And, um, you know, I, I think it was just how it was meant to be. And you're telling great well. stories and you're telling <laughs> great stories. Thanks. And that's, yeah. and that's what we're here for. You know, um, yeah. I, I like that you mentioned, you know, that a lot of Stephen King fans have been generous to you and, yeah. Uh, it is oh. my belief. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. You it was, so you were saying um, were were people disappointed? You know, I. I mean, maybe some people, you mm -hmm. know, but I think a lot of people have been really generous about it and and open minded. I think my concern was always like, especially when I first got started, I I was like, I'm really worried that someone's going to buy this book with one expectation and not get what they paid for, you know? Yeah. And so I tried to be, I tried to really emphasize early on um, what it's not. 
Um, and so that, that was something that I was worried about early on. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. now it's been a long time. I've been doing it for a while and <laughs> yeah. sort of feel like, you know, the books are what they appear to be. Yeah. What I was going to say is, you know, it's my, I, I love, I love the Stephen King spooky stuff, but he is a genuinely good storyteller and he doesn't need to write in horror in order to tell a good story. And you have learned lessons, whether it's from him, whether it's from Peter or whether it's from, um, you know, you thank Joe Lansdale and the yeah. acknowledgements who is okay. a fabulous storyteller, just this wealth of writers who have, you know, influenced your style. And now you are telling great Owen King stories. And if they don't enter into that horror fray, then they don't enter into that horror fray. They're still great stories and readers will always show up for great stories. Yeah, absolutely. Hope so. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm good friends with Keith Lansdale and, and me and him. I, I don't ask him this anymore, but I did ask, a, you know, in the beginning when we started talking, it might have been on his episode. I don't remember at this point, but I asked him what it was like because he can relate to you, Owen, uh, with being a writer and his father being, you know, it's fair to say that Joe's uh, as prolific or whatever as Stephen King. Uh, those both those guys are just unstoppable, and it's um, he pretty much has the same attitude, you know. Uh, it is what it is, and he's just going to do his own thing. I mean, what else, what else can you do? <laughs> you know? Um, I had one question. Sure. Uh, and if you say pass, that's fine. I'll cut this part out. But okay. I was wondering if your mother still writes, because I haven't, she hasn't, I haven't seen her publish anything in a while, and I'm really curious if she's going to be coming out with anything or if she's not. I don't know what she, what she might publish or not. Um... You do have to ask her. It's classified. It's classified. It's classified. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Patrick. That's strictly need to know. That's How dare you even ask? <laughs> How dare I? I'm an interviewer. Fuck me. But <laughs> We are not family. No, we are. <laughs> I would love to talk to her one day. So maybe I'll be able to ask. Um, we'll jump to this. Where can people follow you, sir? So I'm on, uh, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Substack. And... Uh, I think that's the only places I am. I have a Goodreads, but I haven't looked at it in a while. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you don't really do. I mean, Goodreads just kind of like it goes along on its own. You don't really yeah. talk to people there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Candace, where can people follow you? Um, uncomfortably dark. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok in Pittsburgh if you want to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Don't encourage that. You don't yeah, know I get in trouble weirdo, for that answer. You don't know what kind of weirdo <laughs> you'll get. Brennan, where can people follow you? Uh, BrennanLafaro.com has all this stuff. You can follow me at Pierre McDonough on Twitter, uh, the show, any social media platform, Deadhead Space. Um, currently reading, we'll do final thoughts and wrap up. Um, currently reading. Oh, and what are you currently reading? Um, I am currently reading... The title is slipping my mind. Um, I'm currently re well. You know what I'm currently reading? I'm currently reading some Edgar Allan Poe short stories. Oh, nice. Yeah. Is there one in particular that you really love? Uh, I, I was just writing about. Um, I'm doing this um, a little introduction for uh, an edition of The Pale Blue Eye by Louis Bayard. Mm. I was just looking at. Um, uh, the called <laughs> it's really i'm getting sleepy uh it's the one this with the seven rooms the um it's like a masquerade um, oh help us out candace oh i you know now that you want me to help i can't remember the well, that's the one. <laughs> There's a and Vincent Price is in the movie. Oh my yeah. god! We just talked about this last night, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. The death at the. Uh, okay, I'm not. Red gonna death. It was the. It's, it's the, the red death red, one. Yeah. Nailed it. it was, yeah. <laughs> yep. That's what I was just looking at. Um, 
I'll save you guys for last. I am reading, just started this, War Trash by Ha Jing. It's a fake memoir, but he based it off of his father's real experience with the Chinese, uh, I think it's called Volunteer Army or something like that, where they fought uh, with North Korea in the Korean War. Um, it's 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 cool because I, I don't always, like you, Owen, you said that you read diversely. With war, especially, like I want to hear all sides. I'm interested in all sides for uh, the Korean War. Um, I'll leave it at that. I, otherwise, I won't shut up about that topic. Candice, what are you currently reading? I am working my way through an arc called The Night Pro- Prophets by Paul F. Olson, coming out in September from Cemetery Dance. Nice. Yeah. Right what are you reading, sir? Uh, speaking of New Yorkers who are great at storytelling, I am reading Corpse Mouth by John Langan. Oh, I love it. Uh, uh, such a great writer. And, you know, we were talking about intentionality of word choice, and John's got it in spades. That's love a good his writing. That is a very good comparison. Yeah, I agree there. Short stories or, lo- or, or novels. Yep. He has it real good there. Um, final thoughts. Owen, do you have any final thoughts that you want to leave us with? No, it was just lovely to talk to y'all, and uh, I hope we can do it again someday. You count, count on Thanks for having me. Happening. Sure. Uh, Candace, final thoughts? Uh, none. Read everything this man writes. Read everything <laughs> I write. And that Brennan writes, Patrick is coming out soon with some more stuff of his. So, you know, oh, read, wonderful. read, read, read. And Owen King, thank you so very much. It's been grand. I got all dressed up for the occasion. I even did my hair. So. Thank you. <laughs> Brandon, final thoughts, sir. Oh, and thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you uh, making the time for us and hanging out. I am thinking about what an Elmore Leonard fantasy book would be like, and I am <laughs> disappointed that we don't have Raylan Givens dra- Dragon Slayer. <laughs> Patrick, how about you? My final thoughts are I really appreciate uh, this conversation. I definitely want to have this happen again. And, um, I mean, I'm just excited to see where your next book will take us because you're just, you're not easy to guess and pinpoint. Some writers like you aren't, like, I don't know what you're going to come up with next. You, you do a little bit of everything, man, and I like that. Thanks. Um, next episode is called Rising Up Together. It's with Paul Tremblay, John Langan, Victor Laval, Sarah Langan, Livia Llewellyn, and Laird Barron. That's a lot of people in one episode, but yeah, we're going to go there. So, as always, You have many choices in podcasts. Thank you for picking us.